prologue of the wheat princess this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by celine major the wheat princess by jean webster prologue if you leave the city by the porta maggiore and take the via prinastina which leads into the sabine hills at some thirty-six kilometres distance from rome you will pass on your left a grey-walled village climbing up the hillside this is palestrina the old roman prineste and a short distance beyond also on the left you will find branching off from the straight roman highway a steep mountain road which if you stick to it long enough will take you after many windings to castel madama and tivoli several kilometres along this road you will see shooting up from a bare crag above you a little stone hamlet crowned by the ruins of a medieval fortress the town castel vivalanti was built in the days when a stronghold was more to be thought of than a water supply and its people from habit or love or perhaps sheer necessity have lived on there ever since going down in the morning to their work in the plain and toiling up at night to their homes on the hill so steep is its site that the doorway of one house looks down on the roof of the house below and its narrow stone streets are in reality flights of stairs the only approach is from the front by a road which winds and unwinds like a serpent and leads at last to the porta della luna through which all the traffic enters the town the gate is ornamented with the crest of the vivalanti a phoenix rising out of the flame supported by a heavy machicolated top from which in the old days stones and burning oil might be dropped upon the heads of the unwelcome guests the town is a picturesque little affair it would be hard to find a place more so in the sabine villages it is very very poor in the march of the centuries it has fallen out of step and been left far behind to look at it one would scarcely dream that on the clear days the walls and towers of modern rome are in sight on the horizon but in its time castel vivalanti was not insignificant this little hamlet has entertained history within its walls it has bodily outfaced robber barons and papal troops it has been besieged and conquered and alas betrayed and that by its own prince twice has it been raised to the ground and twice rebuilt in one way or another though it has weathered the centuries and it stands to-day grey and forlorn clustering about the walls of its donjon and keep castel vivalanti as in the middle ages still gives the title to a roman prince the house of vivalanti was powerful in its day and the princes may often be met with not always to their credit in the history of the papal states they were oftener at war than at peace with the holy see and there is a story of one pope who spent four weary months watching the view from a very small window in vivalanti's donjon but in spite of their unholy quarrels they were at times devout enough and twice a cardinal's hat has been worn in the family the house of late years has dwindled somewhat both in fortune and importance but nevertheless vivalanti is a name which is still spoken with respect among the old nobles of rome the lower slopes of the hill on which the village stands are well wooded and green with stone pines and cypresses olive orchards and vineyards here the princes built their villas when the wars with the popes were safely at an end and they could risk coming down from their stronghold on the mountain the old villa was built about a mile below the town and the gardens were laid out in terraces and parterres along the slope of the hill it has long been in ruin but its foundations still stand and the plan of the gardens may easily be traced you will see the entrance at the left of the road a massive stone gateway topped with moss-covered urns and a double row of cone-shaped cypresses bordering a once stately avenue now grown over with weeds if you pause for a moment and you cannot help doing so you will see between the portals at the end of the avenue some crumbling arches and even if your eyes are good the fountain itself any contadino that you meet on the road will tell you the story of the old villa vivalanti and the bad prince who was by the grace of god murdered two centuries ago he will tell you a story not uncommon in italy of storehouses bursting with grain while the peasants were starving and of how one moonlight night as the prince was strolling on the terrace contentedly pondering his wickednesses of the day 
a peasant from his own village up on the mountain creeping behind him quiet as a cat stabbed him in the back and dropped his body in the fountain he will tell you how the light from the burning villa was seen as far as rocca di papa in the alban hills and he will add with a laugh and a shrug that some people say when the moon is full the old prince comes back and sits on the edge of the fountain and thinks of his sins but that for himself he thinks it an old woman's tale whereupon he will cast a quick glance over his shoulder at the dark shadow of the cypresses and covertly cross himself as he wishes you a revadella you cannot wonder that the young prince two centuries ago did not build his new villa on the side of the old for even had he like the brave contadino cared nothing for ghosts still it was scarcely a hollowed spot and lovers would not care to stroll by the fountain so it happens that you must travel some distance further along the same road before you reach the gates of the new villa built anno domini sixteen ninety three in the pontificate of his holiness innocent the twelfth here you will find no gloomy cypresses the approach is bordered by spreading plain trees the villa itself is a rambling affair and though slightly time-worn is still decidedly imposing with its various wings its balconies and loggia and marble terrace the new villa for such one must call it faces west and north on the west it looks down over olive orchards and vineyards to the roman campagna with the dome of st peter's a white speck in the distance and beyond it to a narrow shining ribbon of sea on the north it looks up to the sabine mountains with the height of seracte rising like an island on the horizon for the rest it is surrounded by laurel and ilex groves with long shady walks and leafy arbors with fountains and cascades and broken statues all laid out in the stately formality of the seventeenth century but the trees are no longer so carefully trimmed as they were a century ago the sun rarely shines in these green alleys and the nightingales sing all day through every season but especially in the springtime the garden borders are glowing with colour hedges of roses oleanders and golden laburnum scarlet pomegranate blossoms and red and white camellias marguerites and lilies and purple irises bloom together in flaming profusion and twice a year in the spring and the autumn the soft yellow walls of the villa are covered with lavender wisteria and pink climbing roses and every breeze is filled with their fragrance it is a spot in which to dream of old italy of cardinals and pages and gorgeous lackeys of gallant courtiers and beautiful ladies of romeos and juliets trailing back and forth over the marble terrace and making love under the italian moon but if there have been lovers as is doubtless the case there have also been haters among the vivalanti and you may read of more than one prince murdered by hands other than those of his peasants the walls of the new villa in the course of their two hundred years have looked down on their full share of tragedies and the vivalanti annals are grim reading withal and now having pursued the vivalanti so far you may possibly be disappointed to hear that the story has nothing to do with them but if you are interested in learning more of the family you can find his excellency anastasio di vivalanti the present prince and the last of the line any afternoon during the season in the casino at monte carlo he is a slight young man with a dark sallow face and many fine lines under his eyes then why you may ask if we are not concerned with the vivalanti have we lingered so long in their garden ah but the garden does concern us though the young prince may not and it is a pleasant spot you must acknowledge in which to linger the people with whom we are concerned are i hesitate to say it for fear of destroying the glamour an american family yes it is best to confess it boldly are american millionaires it is out the worst is told but why may i ask in my turn is there anything so inherently distressing in the idea of an american family of millionaires spending the summer in a seventeenth-century italian villa up in the sabine hills especially when the rightful heir prefers trente et at monte carlo must they of necessity spoil the romance they are human and have their passions like the rest of us and one of them at least is young and men have called her beautiful yes in this very garden end of prologue read by celine major
Chapter One of the Wheat Princess. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Celine Major. The Wheat Princess by Jean Webster. Chapter One. It was late, and the studio was already well filled when two newcomers were ushered into the room one a woman still almost young and still in a kindly light beautiful the other a girl emphatically young her youth riding triumphant over other qualities which in a few years would become significant a slight almost portentous hush had fallen over the room as they crossed the threshold and shook hands with their host in a group near the door a young man it was laurence sybert the first secretary of the american embassy broke off in the middle of a sentence with the ejaculation ah the wheat princess be careful sybert she will hear you the grey-haired consul-general who stood at his elbow warned sybert responded with a laugh and a half shrug but his tones though low had carried and the girl flashed upon the group a pair of vivid hazel eyes containing a half-puzzled half-questioning light as though she had caught the words but not the meaning her vague expression changed to one of recognition she nodded to the two diplomats as she turned away to welcome a delegation of young lieutenants brilliant in blue and gold and shining boots who is she another member of the group inquired as he adjusted a pair of eyeglasses and turned to scrutinize the american girl she was american to the most casual observer from the piquant details of her gown to the masterly fashion in which she handled her four young men don't you know there was just a touch of irony in sybert's tone miss marcia copley the daughter of the american wheat king i fancy you've seen his name mentioned in the papers well well and so that's willard copley's daughter he readjusted his glasses and examined her again from this new point of view she isn't bad-looking was his comment the wheat princess he repeated the phrase with a laugh i suppose she has come over to marry an italian prince and make the title good the originator of the phrase shrugged anew with the intimation that it was nothing to him who miss marcia copley married and who is the lady with her it was melville the consul-general who replied her aunt mrs howard copley they live in the palazzo rosicorelli ah to be sure yes yes i know who they are her husband's a reformer or a philanthropist or something of the sort isn't he i've seen him at the meets i say you know he added with an appreciative smile that's rather good the way the two brothers balance each other philanthropist and wheat king an english girl in the group turned and studied the american girl a moment with her critical scrutiny marcia copley's appearance was daintily attractive her hat and gown and furs were a burnished brown exactly the colour of her hair every little accessory of her dress was unobtrusively fastidious her whole bearing her easy social grace spoke of a past in which the way had been always smoothed by money she carried with her a touch of imperiousness a large air of commanding the world the english girl noted these things with jealous feminine eyes really she said i don't see how she has the audacity to face people i should think that every beggar in the street would be a reproach to her there were beggars in italy long before willard copley cornered wheat melville returned if what the tribuna says is true some one ventured howard copley is as much implicated as his brother i dare say another laughed millionaire philanthropists have a way of taking back with the left hand what they have given with the right sybert had been listening in a half indifferent fashion to the strictures on the niece but in response to the implied criticism of the uncle he shook his head emphatically howard copley is no more implicated in the deal than i am he declared he and his brother have had nothing to do with each other for the last ten years his philanthropy is honest and his money is as clean as any fortune can be the statement was not challenged sybert was known to be howard copley's friend and he further carried the reputation of being a warm partisan on the one or two subjects which engaged his enthusiasm on those which did not engage it he was nonchalant to a degree for a rising diplomat the two sybert and the consul-general 
with a nod to the group presently drifted onward toward the door the secretary was bent upon departure at the earliest possible opportunity teas were a part of the official routine of his life but by the simple device of coming late and leaving early he escaped as much of their irksomeness as possible aside from being secretary of the embassy sybert was a nephew of the ambassador and it was the latter calling which he found the more onerous burden of the two his excellency had formed a troublesome habit of shifting social burdens to the unwilling shoulders of the younger man they paused at mrs copley's elbow with outstretched hands and were received with a flattering show of cordiality from the aunt though with but a fleeting nod from the niece she was patently too interested in her officers to have much attention left where is your husband sybert asked the lady raised her eyebrows in a picturesque gesture beggars she sighed something has happened to the beggars again mr copley's latest philanthropic venture had been the anti-begging society bread tickets had been introduced the beggars were being hunted down and given work and as a result copley's name was cursed from end to end of rome the men smilingly murmured their commiserations and what are you two diplomats doing here mrs copley asked i thought that mr dessart invited only artists to his teas sybert's gloomy air as he eyed the door reflected the question it was melville who answered oh we are admirers of art even if we are not practitioners besides mr dessart and i are old friends we used to know each other in pittsburgh when he was a boy and i was a good deal younger than i am now his gaze rested for a moment upon their host who formed one of the hilarious group about miss copley he was an eminently picturesque young fellow fitted with the usual artist attributes a velveteen jacket a flowing necktie and rather long light brown hair which constantly got into his eyes causing him to shake his head impatiently as he talked he had an open frank face humorous blue eyes and the inestimable eager air of being in love with life the conversation showing signs of becoming general the officers with visible reluctance made their bows and gave place to the newcomers the girl now found time to extend a cordial hand to melville while to the secretary she tossed a markedly careless good afternoon mr sybert if miss marcia's off-hand manner conveyed something a trifle stronger than indifference so sybert's half-amused smile as he talked to her suggested that her unkindness failed to hurt that she was too young to count and what is this i hear about your moving out to a villa for the spring he inquired turning to mrs copley yes we are thinking of it but it is not decided yet we still have uncle howard to deal with added the girl he was the first one who suggested a villa but now that exactly the right one presents itself we very much suspect him of trying to back out that will never do miss marcia said melville you must hold him to his word we are going out to-morrow to inspect it and if aunt catherine and i are pleased she broke off with a graceful gesture which intimated much sybert laughed poor uncle howard he murmured the arrival of fresh guests called their host away and mrs copley and melville turning aside to greet some friends left miss copley for the moment for a tete-a-tete -tete with sybert he maintained his side of the conversation in a half perfunctory fashion while the girl allowed a slight touch of hostility to creep beneath her animation and where is the villa to be miss marcia at frascati i suppose farther away than frascati at castel vivalanti castel vivalanti up in the sabine hills between palestrina and tivoli oh i know where it is i have a vivid recollection of climbing the hill on a very hot day i was merely exclaiming at the locality it's rather remote isn't it its remoteness is the best thing about it our object in moving into the hills is to escape from visitors and if we go no farther than frascati we shan't do much escaping this to the family's most frequent visitor was scarcely a hospitable speech and a smile of amusement crept to the corners of sybert's mouth apparently just becoming aware of the content of her speech she added with slightly exaggerated sweetness of course i don't mean you mr sybert you come so often that i regard you as a member of the household the secretary apparently had it on his tongue to retort but thinking better of it he maintained a discreet silence 
while their host approached with the new arrivals a lady whose name miss copley did not catch but who was presented with the explanatory remark she writes and several young men who she judged by their neckties were artists also the talk turned on the villa again and miss copley was called upon for a description i haven't seen it myself she returned but from the steward's accounts it is the most complete villa in italy it has a laurel walk and an ilex grove balconies fountains a marble terrace a view and even a ghost a ghost queried dessart but i thought they were extinct that the railroads and tourists had driven them all back to the grave not the ghost of the bad prince we rent him with the place and the most picturesque ghost you ever dreamed of he hoarded his wheat while the peasants were starving and they murdered him two hundred years ago she repeated the story mimicking in inimitable fashion the gestures and broken english of prince vivalanti's steward a somewhat startled silence hung over the close of the recital while her auditors glanced at each other in secret amazement the question uppermost in their minds was whether it was ignorance or mere bravado that had tempted her into repeating just that particular tale it was a subject which miss copley might have been expected to avoid lawrence sybert alone was aware that she did not know what a dangerous topic she was venturing on and he received the performance with an appreciative laugh a very picturesque story miss copley the old fellow got what he deserved marcia copley assented with a smiling gesture and the woman who wrote skilfully bridged over a second pause you were complaining the other day mr dessart that the foreigners are making the italians too modern why do you not catch the ghost he is surely a true antique but i am not an impressionist he pleaded who is saying anything against impressionists a young man asked in somewhat halting english as he paused beside the group no one said dessart i was merely disclaiming all knowledge of them and their ways miss copley allow me to present m benoit the last prix de rome he is the man to paint your ghost he's an impressionist and paints nothing else i suppose you have ghosts enough in the villa medici without having to search for them in the sabine hills ah oui mademoiselle the villa medici has ghosts of many kinds ghosts of dead hopes and dead ambitions among others i should think the ghost of a dead ambition might be too elusive for even an impressionist to catch she returned perhaps an impressionist is better acquainted with them than with anything else suggested dessart a trifle unkindly not when he's young and a prix de rome smiled the woman who wrote mrs copley requiring her niece's presence on the other side of the room the girl nodded to the group and withdrew the writer looked after her with an air of puzzled interest and doesn't miss copley read the papers she inquired mildly evidently she does not sybert rejoined with a laugh as he made his adieus and withdrew half an hour later marcia copley having made the rounds of the room again found herself as tea was being served in the neighbourhood of her new acquaintance she dropped down on the divan beside her with a slight feeling of relief at being for the moment out of the current of chatter her companion was a vivacious little woman approaching middle age and though she spoke perfect english she pronounced her words with a precision which suggested a foreign birth her conversation was diverting it gave evidence of a vast amount of worldly wisdom as well as a wide acquaintance with other people's affairs and her range of subjects was wide she flitted lightly from an artistic estimate of some intaglios of the augustan age that had just been dug up outside the porta pia to a comparison of french and italian dressmakers and a prophecy as to which cardinal would be the next pope a portfolio of sketches lay on a little stand beside them and she presently drew them toward her with the remark we will see how our young man has been amusing himself lately there were half a dozen or so of wash drawings and one or two outline sketches of figures in red chalk none of them was at all finished but the hasty blocking in showed considerable vigour and the subjects were at least original there was no castle of st angelo with a boatman in the foreground and no temple of vesta set off by a line of scarlet seminarists one of the chalk drawings was of an old chestnut woman crouched over a charcoal fire another was of the octroi officer under the tall arch of the san giovanni gate prodding the contents of a donkey cart with a steel rod there were corners of walls shaded by cypresses 
bits of architectural adornment a quick sketch of the lichen covered elephant's head spouting water at villa madama they all slight as they were possessed a certain distinction and suggested a very real impression of roman atmosphere marcia examined them with interest they are extremely good she said as she laid the last one down yes her companion agreed they are so good that they ought to be better but they never will be how do you mean i know paul dessart well enough to know that he will never paint a picture he has talent and he's clever but he's at everybody's service the workers have no time to be polite however she finished it is not for you and me to quarrel with him if he set to work in earnest he would stop giving teas and that would be a pity would it not indeed it would she agreed how pretty the studio looks this afternoon i have seen it only by daylight before and like all the rest of us it improves by candlelight her eyes wandered about the big room with its furnishings of threadbare tapestry and antique carved chairs the heavy curtains had been partly drawn over the windows making a pleasant twilight within a subtle odour of linseed oil and cigarette smoke mingled with the fresh scent of violets pervaded the air paul dessart with the prix de rome man and a young english sculptor of rising fame presently joined them and the talk drifted into roman politics a subject concerning which the artists declared with one accord they knew nothing and cared less oh i used to get excited over their squabbles said the englishman but i soon saw that i should have to choose between that and sculpture i hadn't time for both i don't even know who's premier put in dessart a disgraceful lack of interest maintained the american girl i have only been in rome two months and i am an authority on the triple alliance and the abyssinian war i know what cavour wanted to do and what crispy has done that's not fair miss copley dessart objected you've been going to functions at the embassy and one can absorb politics there through one's skin but i warn you it isn't a safe subject to get interested in it becomes a disease like the opium habit he's not so far from the truth agreed the sculptor i was talking to a fellow this afternoon named sybert who perhaps you know him miss copley yes i know him what about him oh er nothing in that case pray slander mr sybert if you wish i'll promise not to tell he's one of my uncle's friends not one of mine oh i wasn't going to slander him the young man expostulated a trifle sheepishly the only thing i have against sybert is the fact that my conversation bores him marcia laughed with a certain sense of fellow-feeling say anything you please she repeated cordially my conversation bores him too well what i was going to say is that he has had about all the roman politics that are good for him if he doesn't look out he'll be getting in too deep too deep she queried it was dessart who pursued the subject with just a touch of malice lawrence sybert apparently was not so popular a person as a diplomat should be he's lived in rome a good many years and people are beginning to wonder what he's up to the embassy does very well for a blind but he doesn't take any more interest in it than he does in whether or not tammany runs new york all that sybert knows anything about or cares anything about is italian politics and there are some who think that he knows a good sight more about them than he ought he's in with the church party in with the government first friends with the right and then with the left monsieur sybert is what you call an eclectic suggested benoit he chooses the best of each i'm not so sure of that dessart hinted darkly he's interested in other factions besides the vatican and the quirinal there are one or two pretty anarchistic societies in rome and i have heard it whispered you don't mean she asked with wide open eyes the woman who wrote shook her head with a laugh i suspect that mr sybert's long residence in rome might be reduced to a simpler formula than that it was a very wise person who first said cherchez la femme oh really said marcia with a new note of interest lawrence sybert was not a man whom she had ever credited with having emotions and the suggestion came as a surprise rumour says that he still takes a very strong interest in the pretty little contessa torrenieri all i know is that nine or ten years ago when she was margarita caretti 
he was openly among her admirers but she naturally preferred a count or at least her parents did which in italy amounts to the same the girl's eyes opened still wider the contessa torrenieri was also a frequent guest at the palazzo but dessart received the suggestion with a very sceptical smile and you think that he is only waiting until in the ripeness of time old count torrenieri goes the way of all counts i know you are the authority on gossip madame but nevertheless i doubt very much if that is laurence sybert's trouble you don't really mean that he is an anarchist marcia demanded i give him up miss copley the young man shrugged his shoulders and spread out his hands in a gesture purely italian are you talking politics asked mrs copley as she joined the group in company with mr and mrs melville always politics laughed her niece or is it mr sybert now they're practically interchangeable said dessart and did i hear you calling him an anarchist miss marcia melville demanded she repudiated the charge with a laugh i'm afraid mr dessart's the guilty one here here that will never do sybert's a special friend of mine i can't allow you to be accusing him of anything like that a little applied anarchy wouldn't be out of place the young man returned i feel tempted to use some dynamite myself when i see the way this precious government is scattering statues of victor emmanuel broadcast through the land if you are going to get back into politics said mrs copley rising i fear we must leave i know from experience that it is a long subject the two turned away escorted to the carriage by dessart and the frenchman while the rest of the group resettled themselves in the empty places the woman who wrote listened a moment to the badinage and laughter which floated back through the open door then mr dessart's heiress is very attractive she suggested why mr dessart's melville inquired perhaps i was a little premature she conceded though i venture to prophecy not incorrect my dear lady said mrs melville impressively you do not know mrs copley her niece is more likely to marry an italian prince than a nameless young artist she's no more likely to marry an italian prince than she is a south african chief her husband affirmed miss marcia is a young woman who will marry whom she pleases though he added upon reflection i am not at all sure it will be paul dessart she might do worse said his wife paul is a nice boy ah and she might do better i'll tell you exactly the man he added in a burst of enthusiasm and that is laurence sybert the suggestion was met by an amused smile from the ladies and a shrug from the sculptor my dear james said mrs melville you may be a very good business man but you are no matchmaker that is a matter you would best leave to the women as for your laurence sybert he hasn't the ghost of a chance and he doesn't want it i'm doubting he has other fish to fry just now threw out the sculptor sybert's all right said melville emphatically the woman who wrote laughed as she rose it will be an interesting matter to watch she announced but you may mark my words that our host is the man end of chapter one read by celine major chapter two of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain a carriage rumbled into the stone-paved courtyard of the palazzo rosicorelli a good twenty minutes before six o'clock the next evening and the copleys descended and climbed the stairs at peace with villa vivalanti and its thirty miles though it was still light out of doors inside the palace with its deep embrasured windows and heavy curtains it was already quite dark as they entered the long salon the only light in the room came from a seven-branch candlestick on the tea-table which threw its reflection upon gerald's white sailor suit and little bare knees as he sat solemnly in a carved savonarola chair at the sound of their arrival he wriggled down quickly and precipitated himself against mrs copley oh mamma sybert came to tea and i made it and he said it was lots better than marcia's tea and he drank seven cups and i drank four a chorus of laughter greeted this revelation 
and a lazy voice called from the depths of an easy-chair oh i say gerald you mustn't tell such shocking tales or your mother will never leave me alone with the tea-things again and the owner of the voice pulled himself together and walked across the room to shake hands with the newcomers lawrence sybert as he advanced toward his hostess threw a long thin shadow against the wall he had a spare dark clean-shaven face with deep-set sullen eyes he was delightfully perfected type of the cosmopolitan it would have taken a second or very possibly a third glance to determine his nationality but if the expression of his face were italian oriental anything you please his build was undoubtedly anglo-saxon further a certain wiriness beneath his movements proclaimed him to any one familiar with the loose-hung riders of the plains unmistakably american your son slanders me mrs copley he said as he held out his hand i didn't drink but six upon my honour hello sybert anything happened in rome to-day what's the news on the rialto was mr copley's greeting marcia regarded him with a laugh as she drew off her gloves and lighted the spirit lamp we've been away since nine this morning and here's uncle howard thirsting for news already what he will do when we really get out of the city i can't imagine oh and so you've taken the villa have you marcia nodded and you should see it it looks like a papal palace this is the first time that prince vivalanti has ever consented to rent it to strangers it's his official seat very condescending of him the young man laughed and do you accept his responsibilities along with the place from the fattori's account i should say that his responsibilities rest but lightly on the prince of vivalanti ah uh, that's true enough do you know him only by hearsay i know the village and a more desperate little place it would be hard to find in all the sabine hills the people's love for their prince is tempered by the need of a number of improvements which he doesn't supply i dare say they are pretty poor she conceded but they are unbelievably picturesque every person there looks as if he just walked out of a water-colour sketch even uncle howard was pleased and he has lived here so long that he is losing his enthusiasms it's a pretty decent sort of a place copley agreed though i have a sneaking suspicion that we may find it rather far but the rest of the family liked it and my aim in life nonsense uncle howard you know you were crazy over it yourself you signed the lease without a protest didn't he aunt catherine i signed the lease my dear marcia at the point of the pistol the point of the pistol you threatened if we got a mile an inch i believe you said nearer rome you would give a party every day and if that isn't the point of a pistol to a poor worn-out man like me i don't know what is it would certainly seem like it sybert agreed and turning to marcia he added i am afraid that you rule with a very despotic hand miss marcia marcia's eyebrows went up a barely perceptible trifle but she laughed and returned no indeed mr sybert you are mistaken there it is not i but gerald who plays the part of despot in the copley household at this point granton mrs copley's english maid appeared in the doorway marietta is waiting to give master gerald his supper she announced gerald fled to his mother and raised a cry of protest mamma please let me stay up to dinner with you to-night for a moment mrs copley looked as if she might consent but catching sight of granton's relentless face she returned no my dear you have had enough festivity for one evening you must have your tea and go to bed like a good little boy gerald abandoned his mother and entrenched himself behind sybert cause sybert's here and i like sybert he wailed desperately but granton stormed even this fortress come master gerald your supper's getting cold and she laid a firm hand on his shoulder and marched him away there's the real despot laughed copley i tremble before granton myself pietro appeared with a plate of toasted muffins and the evening mail mr copley settled himself in a wicker chair with a pile of letters on the arm at his right and as he ran his eyes over them one by one he tore them in pieces and formed a new pile at his left they were begging letters for the most part he received a great many and this was his usual method of answering them not that he was an ungenerous man it was merely a matter of principle with him not to be generous in this particular way 
as he sat disposing of envelope after envelope with vigorous hands copley's appearance suggested a series of somewhat puzzling contrasts seriousness and humour sensitiveness and force an active impulse to forge ahead and accomplish things a counter-impulse to shrug his shoulders and wonder why he was a puzzle to most of his friends at times even one to his wife but she had accepted his eccentricities along with his millions and though she did not always understand either his motives of his actions she made no complaint to most men a fortune is a blessing to copley it was rather in the nature of a curse he might have amounted to almost anything had he had to work for it but for the one field of activity which a fortune in america seems to entail upon its owner that of entering the arena and doubling and tripling it he was singularly unfitted both by temperament and inclination in this he differed from his elder brother and there was one other point in which the two were at variance though their father had been in the eyes of the law a just and upright man still in the battle of competition many had fallen that he might stand and the younger son had grown up with the knowledge that from a humanitarian standpoint the money was not irreproachable he had the feeling which his brother characterized as absurd that with his share of the fortune he would like in a measure to make it up to mankind howard copley's first move in the game of benefiting humanity had been not very originally an attempt at solving the negro problem but the negroes were ever a leisurely race and copley was a man impatient for results he finally abandoned them to the course of evolution and engaged in a spasmodic orgy of east side politics becoming disgusted and failing of an election he looked aimlessly about for a further object in life it was at this point that mrs copley breathlessly suggested a year in paris for the sake of gerald's french the child was only four but one could not as she justly pointed out begin the study of the languages too early her husband apathetically consenting they embarked for paris by the roundabout route of the mediterranean landed in naples and there they stayed he had found a fascinating occupation ready to his hand that of helping on the work of good government in this still turbulent portion of united italy after a year the family drifted to rome and settled themselves in the piano nobile of the palazzo rosicorelli with something of an air of permanence copley was at last thoroughly contented he had no racial prejudices and rome was as fair a field of reform as new york and infinitely more diverting if the italians did not always understand his motives still they accepted his services with a fair show of gratitude as for mrs copley she had by no means intended their sojourn to be an immigration but she reflected that her husband had to be amused in some way and that reforming italian posterity was perhaps an harmless a way as he could have devised she settled herself very contentedly to the enjoyment of the somewhat shifting foreign society of the capital with only an occasional plaintive reference to her friends in new york and to gerald's french marcia leaning back in her chair watched her uncle dispose of his correspondence with a visible air of amusement he had a thin nervous face traced with fine lines a sharply cut jaw and a mouth which twitched easily into a smile to-night however as he ripped open envelope after envelope he frowned oftener than he smiled and presently as he unfolded one letter he suppressed a quick exclamation of anger read that he said shortly tossing it to the other man sybert perused it with no visible change of expression and leaning over he dropped it into the open grate marcia laughed outright your mail doesn't seem to afford you much satisfaction uncle howard a large share of it's anonymous and not all of it's polite that is what you must expect if you will hound those poor old beggars to death the two men shot each other a look of rather grim amusement the letter in question had nothing to do with beggars but mr copley had no intention of discussing its contents with his niece i find that the usual reward of virtue in this world is an anonymous letter he remarked shrugging the matter from his mind and settling himself comfortably to his tea the guest refused the cup preferred him i haven't the courage he declared after gerald's revelations by the way sybert said copley i have been hearing some bad stories about you to-day my niece doesn't like to have me associate with you marcia looked at her uncle helplessly when he once commenced teasing there was no telling where he would stop i am sorry said sybert humbly what is the trouble she has found out that you are an anarchist both men laughed 
and marcia flushed slightly please miss marcia sybert begged give me time to get out of the country before you expose me to the police there's no cause for fear she returned i didn't believe the story when i heard it for i knew that you haven't energy enough to run away from a bomb much less throw one that's why it surprised me that other people should believe it but most people have a better opinion of me than you have he expostulated no indeed mr sybert i have a better opinion of you than most people i really consider you harmless the young man laughed and bowed his thanks while he turned his attention to mrs copley i hope that villa vivalanti will prove more successful than the one in naples mrs copley looked at him reproachfully that horrible man i never think of him without wishing we were safely back in america then please don't think of him her husband returned he is where he won't trouble you any more what man asked marcia emerging from a dignified silence is it possible miss marcia has never heard of the tattooed man sybert inquired gravely the tattooed man what are you talking about it has a somewhat theatrical ring mr copley admitted it is nothing to make light of said his wife it's a wonder to me that we escaped with our lives three years ago while we were in naples she added to her niece your uncle with his usual recklessness got mixed up with one of the secret societies our villa was out toward posilipo and one afternoon i was driving home at about dusk i had been shopping in the city and just as we reached a lonely place in the road between two high walls mr copley broke in a masked man armed to the teeth sprang up in the path with a horrible oath not really marcia cried leaning forward delightedly aunt catherine did a masked man he wasn't masked but i wish he had been he would have looked less ferocious he came straight to the side of the carriage and taking off his hat with a very polite bow he said that unless we left naples in three days your uncle's life would no longer be safe his shirt was open at the throat and there was a crucifix tattooed upside down on his breast you can imagine what a desperate character he must have been here in italy of all places where the people are so religious the two men laughed at the climax what did you do marcia asked i was too shocked to speak and gerald poor child screamed all the way home and did you leave the city as it happened we were leaving anyway her uncle put in but we postponed our departure long enough for me to hunt the fellow down and put him in jail you may be thankful that they had the decency to warn you sybert remarked it's like a dime novel marcia sighed to be mixed up with murders and warnings and tattooed men and secret societies why didn't you send for me uncle howard well you see i didn't know that you had grown up into such a charming person though i am not sure that it would have made any difference i had all that i could do to take care of one woman that's the way she complained just because one's a girl one is always shut up in the house while there's anything exciting going on if you are so fond of bloodshed sybert suggested you may possibly have a chance of seeing some this spring this spring is the camorra making trouble again oh no not the camorra but unless all signs fail there is a prospect of some fairly exciting riots really here in rome well no probably not in rome there are too many soldiers more likely in the neapolitan provinces i am sorry he added since you seem to find them so entertaining that we can't promise you a riot on your own doorstep but i dare say when it comes to the point you'll find naples near enough i give you fair warning uncle howard she said if there are any riots in naples i'm going down to see them what is the trouble what are they writing about if there are any riots said her uncle you my dear young lady will amuse yourself at villa vivalanti until they are over and he abruptly changed the subject the talk drifted back to the villa again mrs copley afforded their guest a more detailed description nineteen bedrooms aside from the servants quarters and room in the stable for thirty horses she finished the princes of vivalanti must have kept up an establishment in their pre-riviera days mustn't they agreed marcia cordially the new villa was proving an unexpectedly soothing topic we'll keep up an establishment too she added we're going to give a house-party when the roystons come down from paris and i know what we'll do we'll give a ball for my birthday won't we uncle howard 
and have everybody out from rome and the ilex grove all lighted with coloured lamps not if i have anything to say about it said mr copley but you won't have said marcia the only reason that i consented to take this villa was that i thought it was far enough away to escape parties for a time you said i said if you got nearer rome we'd give a party every day while as it is i'm only planning one party for all the three months sybert and i won't come to it he grumbled perhaps you and mr sybert won't be invited i don't know where you'll find two such charming men said mrs copley rome's full of them returned marcia imperturbably who are the roystons miss marcia sybert inquired they are the friends i came over with last fall you know mr dessart the artist yes i know him well mrs royston is his aunt and she has two daughters who are his cousins suggested mr copley yes to be sure and very charming girls they spend a great deal of time over here at least mrs royston and eleanor do margaret has been in college and mr royston asked copley stays in america and attends to his business yes mrs royston and eleanor go over quite often to keep him from getting lonely very generous of them sybert laughed they've spent winters in cairo and vienna and paris and a lot of different places pursued marcia eleanor she added ruminatingly has been out nine seasons and she has had a good deal of experience dear dear said her uncle and you are proposing to expose all rome she's very attractive said marcia and then she glanced at sybert and laughed if she should happen to take a fancy to you mr sybert the young man rose to his feet and looked about for his hat goodness he murmured what would she do there's no telling marcia regarded him with a speculative light in her eyes a young woman who has been practising for nine seasons certainly ought to have her hand in copley agreed perhaps after all sybert it is best we should not meet her sybert found his hat and paused for a moment you can't frighten me that way miss marcia he said with a shake of his head i have been out thirteen seasons myself End of chapter two chapter three of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain may i come in for tea cousin marcia gerald inquired with a note of anxiety in his voice as they climbed the stone staircase of the palazzo rosicorelli they had been spending the afternoon in the borghese gardens and the boy's very damp sailor suit bore witness to the fact that he had been indulging in the forbidden pleasure of catching goldfish in the fountain indeed you may not she returned emphatically you may go with marietta and have some dry clothes put on before your mother sees you gerald realizing the wisdom of this course allowed himself to be quietly spirited off the back way in spite of the fact that he heard the alluring sound of sybert's voice in the direction of the salon marcia went on in without waiting to take off her hat and she met the melvilles in the ante-room on the point of leaving good afternoon why do you go so early she asked oh we are coming back later we are just going home to dress your uncle is giving a dinner to-night a very formal affair is that so she laughed i have not been invited you will be don't feel hurt it's a general invitation issued to all comers marcia found no one within but her aunt and uncle and mr sybert what is this i hear about your giving a dinner to-night aunt catherine she asked as she settled herself in a wicker chair and stretched out her hand for a cup of tea you must ask your uncle i have nothing to do with it mrs copley disclaimed he invited the guests and he must provide the menu what is it uncle howard merely a little farewell dinner i thought we ought to put on a bright face our last night you know one would think you were going to be led to execution at dawn we will hope it's nothing worse than exile said sybert who are your guests and when were they invited my guests are the people who dropped in late to tea i did not think of it early enough to make the invitation very general the list i believe includes the melvilles signora Android, and the contessa torianieri sidney carthrop the sculptor and a certain young frenchman a most alluring youth who had called with him but whose name for the moment escapes me adolphe benoit said sybert le prix de rome asked marcia oh i know him i met him a few weeks ago at tea he's very entertaining i suppose she added considering the list that he will fall to my share 
unless you prefer mr sybert an embarrassing predicament miss marcia sybert laughed if it will facilitate matters we can draw lots not at all said marcia graciously i know the contessa would rather have you and as she is the guest i will let her choose i hope your dinner will be a success she added to her uncle but i can't help feeling that you show a touching faith in the cook thank you my dear i am of an optimistic turn of mind and francois has never failed me yet how did the borghese gallery go very well i met mr dessart there and i met the king outside ah i hope his majesty was enjoying good health he seemed to be i didn't stop to speak to him but there was a boy in a group of seminarists near us who called out viva il papa just as he passed and what happened sybert inquired did the king's guard behead him on the spot or did they only send him to the galleys for life the king's guard fortunately had eyes only for the king and the old priest gathered his flock together and scuttled off down one of the side paths as frightened as a hen who sees a hawk and with good reason but wait till the lads grow up and they'll do something besides shout and run there was an undertone in sybert's voice different from his usual listless drawl marcia glanced up at him quickly and dessart's insinuations flashed through her mind do you mean you would rather have leo the thirteenth king instead of humbert she asked heavens no no one wants the temporal power back not even the catholic themselves i should think that when the italians have gone through so much to get their king they might be satisfied with him they ought to have more patience and not expect the country to be rich in a minute everything can't be done all at once and as for blaming the government because the african war didn't turn out well why no one could foresee the result it was a mistake instead of a crime sybert was watching her lazily with an amused smile about his lips will you pardon me miss marcia if i ask if those are your own conclusions or the opinions of our young friend the american artist he does not plot against the king at any rate she retorted please miss marcia he begged don't think so badly of me as that really i'm not an anarchist i don't want to blow his majesty up go home and dress sybert copley murmured taking him by the arm i have to go and interview the cook and i don't dare leave you and my niece together there's no telling what would happen she's a suspicious young woman sybert complained can't you teach her to take your friends on trust for the matter of that she doesn't even take her uncle on trust and no wonder said marcia i forgot to tell you my other adventure just as the carriage turned into the corso we got jammed in close to the curb and had to stop i looked up and saw a man standing on the sidewalk glaring at me over the top of a newspaper simply glaring and suddenly he jumped to the side of the carriage and thrust the paper in my hands he said something in italian but too fast for me to catch and before i could move marietta had snatched it up and dashed it back in his face the paper was named the cry of the people i just caught one word in it and that was she paused dramatically copley now uncle howard she finished do you think you ought to be trusted when it gets to the point that the people in the street she stopped suddenly she had caught a quick glance between her uncle and sybert what is it she asked do you know what it means it means damned impudence said her uncle i'll have that editor arrested if he doesn't keep still and the two men stood eyeing each other a minute in silence then copley gave a short laugh oh well he said i don't believe the grido del popolo can destroy my character nobody reads it he looked at his watch you'd better go and dress marcia my party begins promptly at eight you needn't use any such clumsy method as that of getting rid of me she laughed i'm not going to stay where i'm not wanted all i have to say she called back from the doorway is that you'd better stop badgering those poor old beggars or you'll be getting a warning to leave rome as well as naples marcia rang for granton have you time to fix my hair now she inquired as the maid appeared or does mrs copley need you mrs copley hasn't begun to dress yet she is watching master gerald eat his supper oh very well then there is time enough i'll get through before she is ready for you do my hair sort of frenchy she commanded as she sat down before the mirror what dress do you think i'd better wear she continued presently that white one i wore last week or the new green one that came from paris yesterday 
i should think the white one miss marcia and save the new one for some party it would be more sensible marcia agreed but she added with a laugh i think i'll wear the new one grandon got it out with an unsmiling face which was meant to convey the fact that she could not countenance this american prodigality she had lived ten years with an elderly english duchess and had thought that she knew the ways of the aristocracy the gown was a filmy green mousseline touched with rose velvet and yellow lace marcia put it on and surveyed herself critically what do you think granton she asked it's very becoming miss marcia granton returned primly yes marcia sighed and very tight she caught up her fan and turned toward the door don't be hurt because i didn't take your advice she called back over her shoulder i never take anybody's granton she found her uncle alone in the salon pacing the floor in a restless fashion with two frowning lines between his brows he paused in his walk as she appeared and his frown gave place readily enough to a smile you look very well to-night he remarked approvingly you er uh, have a new gown haven't you oh yes uncle howard she laughed it's all the gown send your compliments to my dressmaker forty-five avenue de l'opera i thought i would wear it in honour of mr sybert it's so seldom we have him with us mr copley received this statement with something like a grunt there uncle howard i didn't mean to hurt your feelings mr sybert is the nicest man that ever lived and what i particularly like about him is the fact that he's so genial and expansive and thoughtful for others always trying to put people at their ease mr copley refused to smile i am sorry marcia that you don't like sybert he said quietly it's because you don't understand him i dare say and i suppose he doesn't like me for the same reason he is a splendid fellow i've never known a better one and a man can judge marcia laughed uncle howard do you know what you remind me of an italian father who is arranging a marriage for his daughter and having chosen the man is recommending him for her approval oh no i don't go to the length of asking you to fall in love with him though you might do worse but i should be pleased if you would treat him er respectfully as i would my father more respectfully than you do your uncle at any rate he may not be exactly what you'd call a ladies man a ladies man uncle howard you make me furious when you talk like that as if i only liked men with dimples in their chins who dance well and get ices for you i'm sorry if i don't treat mr sybert seriously enough but really i don't think he treats me seriously either you think i don't know anything just because i can't tell the difference between the left and the right i've only just come to rome and i don't see how you can expect me to know about italian politics you both of you laugh whenever i ask the simplest question but you ask such exceedingly simple questions dear how can i help it when you give me such absurd answers i'm sorry we'll try to do better in the future i suppose we've both of us been a little worried this spring and you probe us on a tender point but who ever heard of a man's being really worried over politics that is unless he's running for something they should be regarded as an amusement to while away your leisure you and mr sybert are so funny uncle howard you take your amusement so seriously politics is a broad word marcia he returned with a slight frown and when it stands for oppression and injustice and starving peasants it has to be taken seriously is it really so bad uncle howard good heavens marcia it's awful she was startled at his tone and glanced up at him quickly he was staring at the light with a hard look in his eyes and his mouth drawn into a straight line i'm sorry uncle howard i didn't know what can i do what can any of us do he asked bitterly we can give one day and it's eaten up before night and we can keep on giving but what does it amount to the whole thing is rotten from the bottom can't the people get work no and when they can their earnings are eaten up in taxes the people in the southern provinces are literally starving i tell you and it's worse this year than usual thanks to men like your father and me what do you mean for a moment he felt almost impelled to tell her the truth then as he glanced down at her he stopped himself quickly she looked so delicate so patrician so aloof from everything that was sordid and miserable she could not help and it was better that she should not know 
what do you mean she repeated what has papa been doing oh nothing very criminal he returned only at a time like this one feels as if one's money were a reproach italy's in a bad way just now the wheat crop failed last year and that makes it inconvenient for people who live on macaroni do you mean the people really haven't anything to eat not much how terrible uncle howard won't the government do anything the government is doing what it can there was a riot in florence last month and they lowered the grain tax king humbert gave nine thousand lira to feed the people of pisa a couple of weeks ago you can do the same for some other city if you want to play at being a princess i thought you believed in finding them work instead of giving them money oh as a matter of principle certainly but you can't have em dying on your doorstep you know and to think we're having a dinner to-night when we're not the slightest bit hungry i'm afraid our dinner won't go far toward feeding the hungry in italy how does my dress look my dear asked mrs copley appearing in the doorway i have been so bothered over it she didn't fix the lace at all as i told her these italian dressmakers are not to be depended upon i really should have run up to paris for a few weeks this spring only you were so unwilling howard marcia looked at her aunt a moment with wide-open eyes heavens she thought do i usually talk this way no wonder mr sybert doesn't like me and then she laughed i think it looks lovely aunt catherine and i am sure it is very becoming the arrival of guests precluded any further conversation on the subject of italian dressmakers the contessa torrenieri was small and slender and olive-coloured with a cloud of black hair and dramatic eyes she had a pair of nervous little hands which were never still and a magnetic manner which brought the men to her side and created a tendency among the women to say spiteful things marcia was no exception to the rest of her sex and her comments on the contessa's doings were frequently not prompted by a spirit of charitableness to-night the contessa evidently had something on her mind she barely finished her salutations before transferring her attention to marcia come signorina copley and sit beside me on the sofa we harmonize so well this with a glance from her rose-coloured gown to marcia's rose trimmings i missed you from tea this afternoon she added i trust you had a pleasant walk a pleasant walk marcia questioned off her guard i passed you as i was driving in the borghese but you did not see me you were too occupied she shook her head with a smile it will not do in italy my dear an italian girl would never walk alone with a young man fortunately i am not an italian girl you are too strict contessa sybert who was sitting near put in with a laugh if miss copley chooses there is no reason why she should not walk in the gardens with a young man a girl of the lower classes perhaps but not of signorina copley's class with her dowry she will be marrying an italian nobleman one of these days marcia flushed with annoyance i have not the slightest intention of marrying an italian nobleman she returned one must marry some one said her companion mr melville relieved the tension by inquiring and who was the hero of this episode miss marcia we have not heard his name marcia laughed good-humouredly your friend mr dessart the melvilles exchanged glances i met him in the gallery and as the carriage hadn't come and gerald was playing in the fountain and marietta was flirting with a gendarme dear me aunt catherine i didn't mean to say that we strolled about until the carriage came i'm sure i had no intention of shocking the italian nobility it was quite unpremeditated if the italian nobility never stands a worse shock than that it is happier than most nobilities said her uncle and the simultaneous announcement of monsieur benoit and dinner created a diversion it was a small party and every one felt the absence of that preliminary chill which a long list of guests invited two weeks beforehand is likely to produce they talked back and forth across the table and laughed and joked in the unpremeditated way that an impromptu affair calls forth marcia glanced at her uncle once or twice in half perplexity he seemed so entirely the careless man of the world as he turned a laughing face to answer one of mrs melville's sallies that she could scarcely believe he was the same man who had spoken so seriously to her a few minutes before she glanced across at sybert he was smiling at some remark of the contessa's to which he retorted in italian i don't see how any sensible man can be interested in the contessa 
was her inward comment as she transferred her attention to the young frenchman at her side whenever the conversation showed a tendency to linger on politics mrs copley adroitly redirected it as she knew from experience that the subject was too combustible by far for a dinner party italy italy these men talk nothing but italy she complained to the young frenchman on her right does it not make you homesick for the boulevards i suffered the nostalgie once he confessed but rome is a good cure marcia shook her head in mock despair and you too monsieur benoit patriotism is certainly dying out not while you live said her uncle oh i know i'm abnormally patriotic she admitted but you're also sluggish in that respect that you force it upon one there are other useful virtues besides patriotism sybert suggested wait until you have spent a spring in the sabine hills miss copley melville put in and you will be as bad as the rest of us ah mademoiselle benoit added fervently springtime in the sabine hills would be compensation sufficient to most of us for not seeing paradise i believe with my uncle it's a kind of roman fever she cried i never expected to hear a frenchman renounce his native land it is not that i renounce france the young man remonstrated i love france as much as ever but i open my arms to italy as well to love another land and peoples besides your own makes you not littler but as you say wider broader we are we are ah mademoiselle he broke off if you would let me talk in french i could say what i mean but how can one be eloquent in this halting tongue of yours coraggio benoit you are doing bravely sybert laughed we are the young man went on with a sudden inspiration what you call in english citizens of the world you mademoiselle are american la signora contessa is italian mr carthrope is english i am french but we are all citizens of the same world and in whatever land we find ourselves there we recognize one another for brothers and are always at home for it is still the world the young man's eloquence was received with an appreciative laugh and how about paradise some one suggested ah my friends it is there that we will be strangers benoit returned tragically citizens of the world sybert turned the stem of his wine-glass meditatively as he repeated the phrase it seems to me in spite of miss marcia that one can't do much better than that if you're a patriotic citizen of the world i should think you'd done your duty by mankind and might reasonably expect to reap a reward in benoit's paradise he laughed and raised his glass here's to the world our fatherland may we all be loyal citizens i think said mrs melville since this is a farewell dinner and we are pledging toasts we should drink to villa vivalanti and a happy spring in the sabine hills copley bowed his thanks if you will all visit the villa we will pledge it in the good wine of vivalanti and here's to the vivalanti ghost said the young frenchman may it live long and prosper italy's the place for such ghosts to prosper copley returned here's to the poor people of italy may they have enough to eat said marcia sybert glanced up in sudden surprise but she did not look at him she was smiling across at her uncle End of chapter three chapter four of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain the announcement that a principe americano was coming to live in villa vivalanti occasioned no little excitement in the village wagons with furnishings from rome had been seen to pass on the road below the town and the contadini in the wayside vineyards had stopped their work to stare and had repeated to each other rumours of the fabulous wealth this signor principe was said to possess the furniture they allowed to pass without much controversy but they shook their heads dubiously when two wagons full of flowering trees and shrubs wound up the roadway toward the villa this foreigner must be a grasping person as if there were not trees enough already in the sabine hills that he must bring out more from rome the dissection of the character of prince vivalanti's new tenant occupied so much of the people's time that the spring pruning of the vineyards came near to being slighted the fountain-head of all knowledge on the subject was the landlord of the croce d'oro he himself had had the honour of entertaining their excellencies at breakfast on the occasion of their first visit to castel vivalanti 
and with unvarying eloquence he nightly recounted the story to an interested group of loungers in the trattoria kitchen of how he had made the omelette without garlic because princes have delicate stomachs and cannot eat the food one would cook for ordinary men of how they had sat at that very table and the young signorina principessa who was beautiful as the holy angels in paradise had told him with her own lips that it was the best omelette she had ever eaten and of how they had paid fifteen lira for their breakfast without so much as a word of protest and then of their own accord had given three lira more for mansa eighteen lira corpo di bacco that was the kind of guest he wished would drop in every day but when domenico paterno the baker of castel vivalanti heard the story he shrugged his shoulders and spread out his palms and asserted that a prince was a prince all over the world and that the americano had allowed himself to be cheated from stupidity not generosity for his part he thought the devil was the same whether he talked american or italian but it was reported on the other hand that bianca rosini had also talked with the forestieri when she was washing clothes in the stream they had stopped their horses to watch the work and the signorina had smiled and asked if the water were not cold for her part she was sure american nobles had kind hearts domenico however was not to be convinced by any such counter evidence as this smiles are cheap he returned sceptically does any one know of their giving money no one did know of their giving money but there were plenty of boys to testify that they had run by the side of the carriage fully a kilometre asking for soldi and the signori had only shaken his head to pay them for their trouble si si what did i tell you domenico finished in triumph american princes are like any others perhaps a little more stupid but for the rest exactly the same there were no facts at hand to confute such logic and one night domenico appeared at the croce d'oro with a fresh piece of news his son tarquinio who kept an osteria in rome had told the whole story his name is copli signor eduardo copli and it is because of him domenico scowled that i pay for my flour twice the usual price when the harvest failed last year and he saw that wheat was going to be scarce he sent to america and he bought all the wheat in the land and he put it in storehouses he is holding it there now while the prices go up 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 and when the poor people in italy get very very hungry and are ready to pay whatever he asks then perhaps very charitably he will agree to sell Ja, that is the truth he insisted darkly everybody knows it in rome doubtless he thinks to escape from his sin up here in the mountains but he will see it will follow him wherever he goes Mache. it is the story of the bad prince over again finally one morning one friday morning some of the children of the village who were in the habit of loitering on the highway in the hope of picking up stray soldi reported that the americans horses and carriages had come out from rome and that the drivers had stopped at the inn of st agapito and ordered wine like gentlemen it was further rumoured that the principe himself intended to follow in the afternoon the matter was discussed with considerable interest before the usual noonday siesta it is my opinion said tommaso ferri the blacksmith as he sat in the baker's doorway washing down alternate mouthfuls of bread and onion with vivalanti wine it is my opinion that the signor americano must be a very reckless man to venture on so important a journey on friday and particularly in lent it is well known that if a poor man starts for market on friday he will break his eggs on the way and because a rich man has no eggs to break is that any reason the buon dio should overlook his sin things are more just in heaven than on earth he added solemnly and in my opinion if the foreigner comes to-day he will not prosper in the villa domenico nodded approvingly see si, see si, tommaso is right the americano has already tempted heaven far enough in this matter of the wheat and it will not be the part of wisdom for him to add to the account apoplexies are as likely to fall on princes as on bakers and a dead prince is no different from any other dead man only that he goes to purgatory it was evident however that the foreigner was in truth going to tempt fate for in the afternoon two empty carriages came back from the villa and turned toward palestrina obviously bound for the station all the ragazzi of castel vivalanti waited on the road to see them pass and beg for coppers and it was just as domenico had foretold they never received a single soldo 
the remarks about the principe americano were not complimentary in castel vivalanti that night but the little yellow-haired principino was handled more gently the black-haired little italian boys told how he had laughed when they turned somersaults by the side of the carriage and how he had cried when his father would not let him throw soldi and the general opinion seemed to be that if he died young he at least had a chance of paradise End of chapter four chapter five of the wheat princess by jean webster this librivox recording is in the public domain meanwhile the unconscious subjects of castel vivalanti's apoplexies were gaily installing themselves in their new old dwelling the happy hum of life had again invaded the house and its walls once more echoed to the ring of a child's laughter they were a very matter-of-fact people these americans and they took possession of the ancestral home of the vivalanti as if it were as much their right as a seaside cottage at newport upstairs granton and marietta were unpacking trunks and hampers and laying paris gowns and antique roman clothes chests in the villa kitchen francois was rattling copper pots and kettles and anxiously trying to adapt his modern french ideas to a medieval roman stove while from every room in succession sounded the patter of gerald's feet and his delighted squeals over each new discovery for the past two weeks roman workmen and castel vivalanti cleaning women had been busily carrying out mrs copley's orders the florid furniture and coloured chandeliers of the latter vivalanti had been banished to the attic or what answers to an attic in a roman villa while the faded damask of a former generation had been dusted and restored tapestries covered the walls and hung over the balustrade of the marble staircase dark rugs lay on the red tile floors carved chests and antique chairs and tables of coloured marble supported by gilded griffins were scattered through the rooms in the bedrooms the heavy draperies had been superseded by curtains of an airier texture while wicker chairs and chintz-covered couches lent an unroman air of comfort to the rooms in spite of his humorous grumbling about the trials of moving day mr copley found himself very comfortable as he lounged on the parapet towards sunset smoking a pre-prandial cigarette and watching the shadows as they fell over the campagna gerald was already up to his elbows in the fountain and the ilex grove was echoing his happy shrieks as he prattled in italian to marietta about a marvellous two-tailed lizard he had caught in a cranny of the stones copley smiled as he listened for castel vivalanta to the contrary his little boy was very near his heart marcia and the house had been gaily superintending the unpacking and running back and forth between the rooms as excited by her new surroundings as gerald himself what time does villa vivalanti dine she inquired while on a flying visit to her aunt's room eight o'clock when any of us are in town and half-past seven other nights i suppose it's half-past seven to-night alors shall i make a grand toilette in honour of the occasion put on something warm whatever else you do i distrust this climate after sundown you're such a distrustful person aunt catherine i can't understand how one can have the heart to accuse this innocent old villa of harbouring malaria she returned to her own room and delightedly rummaged out a dinner-gown from the ancient wardrobe with a little laugh at the thought of the many different styles it had held in its day perhaps some other girl had once occupied this room very likely a young princess vivalanti two hundred years before had hung silk embroidered gowns in this very wardrobe it was a big rather bare delightfully italian apartment with tall windows having solid barred shutters overlooking the terrace the view from the windows revealed a broad expanse of campagna and hills marcia dressed with her eyes on the landscape and then stood a long time gazing up at the broken ridges of the sabines glowing softly in the afternoon light picturesque little mountain hamlets of battered grey stone were visible here and there clinging to the heights and in the distance the walls and towers of a half-ruined monastery stood out clear against the sky she drew a deep breath of pleasure to be an artist and to appreciate and reproduce this beauty suddenly struck her as an ideal life she smiled at herself as she recalled something she had said to paul dessart in the gallery the day before she had advised him an artist to exchange italy for pittsburgh mr copley who was strolling on the terrace glanced up and catching sight of his niece paused beneath her balcony while he quoted but soft what light through yonder window breaks it is the east and juliet is the sun marcia brought her eyes from the distant landscape to a contemplation of her uncle and then she stepped through the glass doors and leaned over the balcony railing with a little laugh you make a pretty poor romeo uncle howard she called down i'm afraid the real one never wore a dinner jacket 
nor smoked a cigarette mr copley spread out his hands in protest for the matter of that i doubt if juliet ever wore a gown from where was it forty two avenue de l'opera how does the new house go he asked beautifully i feel like a princess on a balcony awaiting for the hunters to come back from the chase i can't get over the idea that i'm a usurper myself and that the rightful heir is languishing in a donjon somewhere in the cellar come down and talk to me i'm getting lonely so far from the world marcia disappeared from the balcony and reappeared three minutes later on the loggia she paused on the top step and slowly turned around in order to take in the whole affect the loggia in its rehabilitation made an excellent lounging place for a lazy summer morning it was furnished with comfortably deep oriental rush chairs a crimson rug and awnings and at either side of the steps white azaleas growing in marble cinerary urns isn't this the most fun you ever had uncle howard she inquired as she brought her eyes back to mr copley waiting on the terrace below we'll have coffee served out here in the morning and then when it gets sunny in the afternoon we'll move to the end of the terrace under the ilex trees villa vivalanti is the most thoroughly satisfying place i ever lived in she ran down the steps and joined him aren't those little trees nice she asked nodding toward a row of oleanders ranged at mathematical intervals along the balustrade i think that aunt catherine and i plan things beautifully if every one were as well pleased with his own work as you appear to be this would be a contented world there's nothing like the beautiful enthusiasm of youth it's a very good thing to have just the same said marcia good-naturedly and without mentioning any names i know one man who would be less disagreeable if he had more of it none of that said her uncle our pact was that if i stopped grumbling about the villa being so abominably far from rome you were not to utter any er unpleasant truths about mr sybert very well i'll not mention him again and you'll please not to refer to the thirty-nine kilometres it's a bargain gerald i judge has found the fountain she added as a delighted shriek issued from the grove and a menagerie as well if he will only keep them out of doors i shall dream of finding lizards in my bed if you only dream of them you will be doing well i dare say the place is full of bats and lizards and owls and all manner of ruin haunting creatures you're such a pessimist uncle howard between you and aunt catherine the poor villa won't have a shred of character left for my part i approve of it all particularly the ruins i am dying to explore them do you think it's too late to-night far too late you'd get malaria to say nothing of missing dinner here comes pietro now to announce the event as the family entered the dining-room they involuntarily paused on the threshold struck by the contrast between the new and the old in the days of cardinal vivalanti the room had been the chapel and it still contained its gothic ceiling appropriately redecorated to its new uses with grape wreathed trellises and in the central panelling back is crowned with vines the very modern dinner-table with its glass and silver and shaded candles looked ludicrously out of place in the long dusky vaulted apartment which in spite of its rakish frescoes tenaciously preserved the air of a chapel the glass doors at the end were thrown wide to a little balcony which overlooked the garden and the ilex grove and the room was flooded with a nightingale song marcia clasped her hands ecstatically isn't this perfect aren't you glad we came aunt catherine i feel like forgiving all my enemies uncle howard i'm going to be lovely to mr sybert don't promise anything rash he laughed you'll get acclimated in a day or two gerald in honour of the occasion and because marietta under the stress of excitement had forgotten to give him his supper was allowed to dine en famille elated by the unwonted privilege and by his new surroundings he babbled gaily of the ride in the cars and the little boys who turned some all sorts by the roadside and of the beautiful two-tailed lizard of the fountain whose charms he dwelt on lovingly but he had missed his noonday nap and though he struggled bravely through the first three courses his head nodded over the chicken and salad and he was led away by marietta still sleepily boasting in a blend of english and italian of the bellissimi animali he would catch domani morning in the fountain it's a pity said marcia as the sound of his prattle died away gerald hasn't some one of his own age to play with yes it is a pity copley returned i passed a lonely childhood myself and i know how barren it is that is the chief reason that would make me want to go back to new york said his wife 
her husband smiled i suppose there are children to be found outside of new york there are the kirkups in rome she agreed but they are so boisterous and they always quarrel with gerald whenever they come to play with him i am not sure myself but that gerald quarrels with them returned her husband however fond he might be of his offspring he cherished no motherly delusions but perhaps you are right he added with something of a sigh it may be necessary to take him back to america before long i myself have doubts if this cosmopolitan atmosphere is the best in which to bring up a boy i should have wished him to spend a winter in paris for his french said mrs copley plaintively but i dare say he can learn it later marcia didn't begin till she was twelve and she has a very good accent i'm sure mr copley twisted the handle of his glass in silence i suppose after all he said finally to no one in particular if you manage to bring up a boy to be a decent citizen you've done something in the world i don't know marcia objected with a half laugh if one man whom we will suppose is a decent citizen brings up one boy to be a decent citizen and does nothing else i don't see that much as gain to the world your one man has merely shifted the responsibility mr copley shrugged a trifle perhaps the boy might be better able to bear it of course it would be easier for the man to think so she agreed but if everybody passed on his responsibilities there wouldn't be much progress the boys might do the same you know when they grew up mrs copley rose if you two are going to talk metaphysics i shall go into the salon and have coffee alone it's not metaphysics it's theology her husband returned marcia is developing into a terrible preacher i know it marcia acknowledged i'm growing deplorably moral i think it must be the roman air it doesn't affect most people that way her uncle laughed i don't care for any coffee catherine i will smoke a cigarette on the terrace and wait for you out there he disappeared through the balcony doors and marcia and her aunt proceeded to the salon marcia poured the coffee and her aunt said as she received her cup i really believe your uncle is getting tired of rome and will be ready to go back before long i don't believe he's tired of rome aunt catherine i think he's just a little bit well discouraged nonsense child he has nothing to be discouraged about he is simply getting restless again i know the signs i have never known him to stay as long as this in one place before i only hope that he will not think of any ridiculous new thing to do but will be satisfied to go back to new york and settle down quietly like other people it seems to me said marcia slowly as if he might do more good there because he would understand better what the people need there are plenty of things to be done even in new york oh yes when he once got settled he would find any amount of things to take up his time he might even try yachting for a change i am sure that keeps men absorbed marcia sipped her coffee in silence and glanced out of the window at her uncle who was pacing up and down the terrace with his hands in his pockets he looked a rather lonely figure in the half-darkness it suddenly struck her as she watched him that she did not understand him she had scarcely realized before that there was anything to understand mrs copley set her cup down on the table and marcia rose let's go out on the terrace aunt catherine you go out my dear and i will join you later i want to see if gerald is asleep i neglected to have a crib sent out for him and the dear child thrashes around so what with a bed four feet high and a stone floor it would be disastrous marcia agreed she crossed the loggia in the terrace and silently fell into step beside her uncle it was almost dark and a crescent moon was hanging low over the top of guadagnolo a faint lemon light still tinged the west throwing into misty relief the outline of the alban hills the ilex grove was black gruesomely black and the happy song of the nightingales and the splashing of the fountain sounded uncanny coming from the darkness but the white irregular mass of the villa formed a cheerful contrast with its shining lights which threw squares of brightness on the marble terrace and the trees marcia looked about with a deep breath it's beautiful isn't it uncle howard they paused a moment by the parapet and stood looking down over the plain isn't the campagna lovely she added half covered with mist yes it's lovely and the mist means death to the peasants who live beneath it she exclaimed half impatiently uncle howard why can't you let anything be beautiful here without spoiling it by pointing out an ugliness beneath i'm sorry it isn't my fault that the ugliness exists 
look upon the mist as a blessed dew from heaven if it makes you any happier of course i should rather know the truth but it seems as if the italians are happy in spite of things they strike me as the happiest people i have ever seen ah uh, well perhaps they are happier than we think i'm sure they are said marcia comfortably anglo-saxons particularly new englanders and most particularly mr howard copley worry too much it's at least a fault the italians haven't learned he replied but after all as you say it may be the better fortune to have less and worry less i'd like to believe it end of chapter five read by celine major